So my husband was a very, very, very lucky man this year. When he put his name in for the permit process, he drew two permits. And he won one for the Yampa and one for the Selway River in Idaho. And um, when we got back from the Selway, of course, I took some pictures and video and started posting those to social media. And I have this video here of me running Jim's Creek, and it's the last class three, four rapid on the Selway River. And you know, people were liking it, and I was like, yeah, we ran this big river. Um, and this is kind of what it looked like. Go, way, go, go. go. <laughs> So that's me in the yellow boat, and then my great friend Abby's coming right behind me. Clean up. Did you say great friend? <laughs> great friend. So one of my friends posted on here, April Lou, you were so brave. And I was like, I had to take a minute because in my kayaking career, like that's never been me. That's never, I've never been the brave one. I've never been the person that's gonna run the rapid first or jump into the big hole or go off the waterfall. And so I had to take a moment to be like, maybe that is me. <laughs> and so one of the things I think about being brave is that uh, people think we're just born that way, that it's just natural, that you just kind of come into bravery all of a sudden. But my story of bravery is really one about growing into courage and it took me about 20 years to get to this point. It didn't happen overnight. And I think sometimes uh, we shortchange ourselves in the process of things that we love when we believe that we're only born <laughs> into it rather than we can grow into it and cultivate and learn the lessons of growth. And so I think what I want to talk about tonight is my river story and what it's been like to grow into courage. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about my art story because it's somewhat similar and really different, and then we're gonna do some painting later on. So I think it's really easy for us to think about people kind of just being born into courage, and these are pictures of uh, Nick Troutman, Emily Jackson, and their son, Tucker, and you just get that sense of like, you're just already in the river. You can barely walk, you can probably barely swim, and already you're in a kayak. Um, and then we have a homegrown Colorado, and this is Abby Holcomb. At the age of 12, she was the youngest gal to descend the whole Grand Canyon. And I think for me, sometimes I'm like, you know, they, they didn't have to grow much. They just kind of like, -da, they, they were born running big rivers. And then sometimes you have these people that within two years, they're kayaking from first roll to class five. And um, for me, that just wasn't my story. And I sometimes wish it were, but now um, I've got a different story I want to tell us a little bit about. So uh, my story starts with Ed and Ava, and these are my parents, and they are good, good people, and they taught me and my sister to be good people, and we did things like we went to church, and we took piano lessons, and my dad golfed a lot, and my mom gardened, and um, I think we did swimming lessons, and maybe a couple other things like that, but risk-taking was not a part of our life. We were the better safe than sorry family. We were the follow the rules family, order is good type of family. And so this idea of like seeing risk-taking people, I didn't really have those as role models very much. Um, but some people became our role models, and I'll tell you about three. So the first is Bob, and he was my camp director. I grew up going to summer camp, and that was my dream in life, was to work at summer camp so I could play guitar and sing and do camp games and make camp crafts with kids. And uh, I was interviewing with Bob, and he said, have you ever thought about wilderness camp? And I'm like, what's wilderness? He's like, you know, backpacking stuff. I'm like, hmm. You should give it a try. So my very first backpacking trip, and that's me over there, big hair on the right, uh, was leading some 16-year-olds on the Appalachian Trail, and I knew nothing. I wore cotton socks, and I had brand new boots, and you can't see it in the picture very well, but I even had like big old hoop earrings. Uh, but I came back off of this trip like, my world has changed. I can't believe my parents never showed me this life. Uh, and I was just amazed with the, the life of living in the outdoors. So Bob continued to kind of grow our wilderness program, and one summer he was like, let's do whitewater. And he bought a bunch of Kiwi kayaks, and I know there's one person in here that knows a Kiwi, old perception boat, flat lake kayak, and he said, let's go run whitewater. So this was one of our first trips, and what I remember about this trip is I swam every single rapid until Bob got to the last one, he's like, I'm tired of cleaning up all your crap. Let's just get you in the boat with me, and we'll paddle tandem through all this stuff. And had I based, you know, that first experience of kayaking off that first day, would not have thought that that would be something that I loved and wanted to pursue a little bit more. But Bob was really good about keep 
offering and keep encouraging and offering opportunities to do things that stretch you. Well, finished college and I decided I wanted to go to more college and I went to graduate school in Western North Carolina. And Western North Carolina um, is an amazing place for whitewater boating. And my college in particular, there are rivers within five minute drives and all sorts of great places. So I had for my very first kayak, this old green Corsica Perception. It was long and fat and it was so comfortable. And then eventually I kind of moved up in the world and I got a shorter boat with a dagger red line. But it was in Western North Carolina that I just really started to find boating family, boating community, started to stretch a little bit of my boating boundaries. Um, and I decided one summer that I was like, wanted to do more boating. And so what do you want to do if you do more boating? You get a job on the river. So I worked for the Nanahala Outdoor Center. And I was running the Nanahala, which is really just class two with one big class three at the end. And they let you take people down for free. So this is Ed and Ava again, taking some risk, uh, running this with me. And then one summer when I worked there, they were like, no more Nanahala. Let's move you over to the Nolichucky. And the Nolichucky is a class three, four river, pretty technical. And I think it was maybe a little bit too much for me. You probably can't see totally in this picture, but I was so scared. Like I was not the raft guy that needed to be running that river just because I just hadn't even kayaked rivers like that. And so I was just kind of scared. So uh, you see this is a guy named Scott. He was my trainer in this picture. And it almost looks like we're doing uh, strokes against each other. <laughs> so he was probably saving the raft from flipping over in that particular case. But I was not a good raft guide, especially starting out um, one of the rapids on this river was called Quarter Mile, and the way the company ran this was you'd run a raft down first, guide would hop out, then they'd go downstream, set up a rope for safety for other people to run through, come back. So I did that. I kind of ran down, set my rope for safety, came back to my boat, and I think I must have like pushed off, and it starts floating away down this class four rapid. I'm like, no! Well, luckily I was still in training, and there was a trainer guide, and she's like, what's going on? She was able to like save everyone. But that was kind of like typical of my raft guiding experience. Like I was not the guide you wanted to have um, guide your boat. But I got to meet this guy and he's standing at the back. This is Tyson. So he was my trainer on another river. And when we met, we were kind of played the game of like, yes, we like you to know. But we kept kayaking in common and lots and lots of kayaking. But he was this guy. Okay. <laughs> so he was fearless. This is uh, Oceana on the Tallulah Gorge. But he had rafted for NOC on the Chattooga doing technical water for eight years. Um, and so a lot of our kayaking stuff, he was doing these rivers. He felt totally home, comfortable, just easy for him. And they were pushy. And we had lots of moments in our relationship where I'd be standing at the top of these rapids. We're like, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this. And probably cry. And then sometimes go and sometimes walk. And you know, I, all of my chances of getting down, I just thought were luck. That sense of like, oh my gosh, I made it. I don't really know how. But lots of our relationship was kind of that he was trying to figure out how do I encourage her, how do I push her, and at the same time, like, get to go do these rivers together. But um, while we were dating, I moved on from NOC, and I went to work for Howard Bound, but I went to go lead canoe and kayaking expeditions. I kind of dialed down some of the whitewater. But when I was working up in Maine, I met a group of people that did water stuff all the time, and they loved boating. So much so that on this farm that had no energy, they would crank up the generator at night and put on the projector screen and watch old videos of slalom races and C1 boats. And they wanted to do water all the time. And they even spent their Thanksgiving big holidays and Christmas holidays in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. I was like, what? <laughs> what was all of that about? My family, we just did things at home under the Christmas tree. So Outward Bound kind of introduced me to a culture of people that started to live rivers and live water all the time. So fast forward a little bit, Tyson and I get married. Uh, we had one thing in our prenuptial, maybe two things in our prenuptial, and I'm just kidding. One was that we couldn't live in the city, and he was living in Raleigh, North Carolina at the time, and I was like, no, 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 anywhere but there. And so we had a chance to move to Colorado, and we took it. And the other thing was after he gave me a ring, I was like, no more of this stuff, only buy me boats. So those were the two conditions we had when we got married. So we come to Colorado, and Oh, we had been here not too long, and we had the opportunity with Tyson's dad. He was friends with a paddling group in the Pacific Northwest, and he said, hey, I have an opportunity for you guys to run the Grand Canyon. Do you want to go? Well, I knew that all those Outward Bound people have taught me, you do the Grand Canyon, you, like, stop your life, and you go. Well, this particular trip taught us several lessons, and lesson number one was, like, you need a lot of crap when you do rafting trips. <laughs> Uh, lesson number two is it taught us about the scale of Western whitewater. 
Back east, a lot of times when you run rivers, you have a line, and the line might be from you to over here, and you need to be maybe like just right down on that line or else bad consequences happen. Uh, out west, the line, they're like, yeah, as long as you're between this piece and this over here, you're good. And we're like, we can do that. Um, it taught us a lot about wind. And I don't know which one of us had the bright idea <laughs> to bring a kite on a river trip. Obviously, we had never gone before, but one day it was windy enough for the kite. And we're like, this is so cool. We'll fly our kite while we row down the river. <laughs> we learned that when it's windy enough for a kite on the river, it's a really miserable day. And we soon put the kite down, and we were sitting across from each other in the raft, like push, pull, push, pull, just to make it down the river. Um, we learned a couple of lessons here. So this is in Hermit, and Hermit is one of the big rapids, probably the Class E, Class 9, known for huge, huge waves. And once upon a time, it had huge waves, and on the end of the skyscraper wave, sometimes it would break and flick a little bit, and you kind of wanted to miss that. Well, we had been running the big rapids earlier that day. Horn and granite, been fine getting out of scout. And when we get out here, and Tyson's like, don't even get out of the boat. I'll run real quick. Go scout it. He's like, hey, it was just a big wave train. You know, well, I don't even know why we scouted this thing. I'm like, well, the guidebook says you might want to run it a little bit left. No, run it down the middle. So we're running, we're running, and we hit this part of the wave, and literally a, a millisecond after this, we both got flicked from the boat. And so I pop out, and I grab the chicken line. I'm like, oh, Tyson will pull me back in. I look back, and he's not there. I'm like, oh, no. Luckily, he was popped close enough to the oar that we were both able to kind of get back in. But he hops in first, and he reaches down to grab me. And can you see in that picture? I'm uh, <laughs> having a raincoat over a PFD. And I should have known better. So the two things we kind of learned in this particular experience, one is always give reverence to the water, not to get into that point of thinking like, oh, you got this made, dial it in. Uh, and the other one is just basic things that we know in safety world, to wear your life jacket on the outside so someone can grab your lapels and pull you back in if you need. Um, one of the other things that we learned is that the time of year in the Grand Canyon, it's really important to pick your time of year. This particular hike, is above Tapeats Creek, and we were there in June, and I can remember kind of like hiking around these edges, and it was so hot. You wanted, uh, you wanted to touch the rocks to kind of have some balance, but it was so hot, you'd kind of burn your hand if you did. And then we had a layover day on a 120 degree day, and we're all just like, Ugh, miserable. So Grand Canyon taught us a lot of things. For us, don't go in the summer. Uh, when it's windy enough for a kite, it is a miserable day. Always respect the water, and then I don't have too many pictures of this, but one of the huge lessons we learned is that the people you go with make the trip. When we came back from this particular trip, um, I think we had that sense of like, yeah, we did the Grand Canyon, but then when we started telling the stories, we were like, we had this crazy trip leader that kind of yelled at everyone, and she never let us know the plan for the day. And then some of the people, they really couldn't even row, and then and they were like, you know, that was actually a really, really bad trip. And so... Um, <laughs> What it did for us, though, is it propelled us into the river life. And we bought our own raft, and we were able to start to make our river family. So even Ed and Ava okay, have joined us on these trips. And then our sweet dogs have been able to come with us on the river trips. And then our family has grown exponentially. And some of our river family is here tonight. But we have all sorts of family that we do these trips with. And uh, sometimes you even have Batman come along. You know, and Chewbacca joined us this summer on the trip. And then a whole host of crazy people will come on these trips sometimes. But even these two, anyone recognize them? <laughs> this is Phil and Carol, some of the co-owners of the store. So, um, And we've been able to share Thanksgiving and, and to do several of our holidays on the river. And uh, the past two years, we've been able to go down Ruby Horse Thief and have Thanksgiving dinner in the Dutch oven. So... The river, I think with Tyson being that person that even though early in our relationship we were kind of like, oh, you're making me cry, I don't want to do this. What's happened with the river and why it's been a significant part is it's really been the story, it's been the theme that's been threading the story together of us and our family and our lives. So I always get anxious, especially in Colorado when there's, the water kind of dries up during the winter. I'm like, ah, oh, let's go somewhere. So a couple years ago we had a chance to paddle in Costa Rica, uh, run in some jungle rivers. And then uh, last year we got to do one of my dream trips and we went to Canada we went to the Madawaska Canoe Center and we got to be like Canadians wearing bug nets and swatting bugs away from our faces and uh, being like Canadians paddling canoes and then uh, having lots of fun as we were catching rapids 
And so all of this began to kind of um, bring courage to my life in some ways I didn't know about. But then a third person appears in the story, and this is my friend Abby. And so I live up in Cold Creek Canyon, and it's a small community, and we have a, a community center, and on Monday nights there's yoga. So about six or seven years ago, Abby started teaching this class. Well, she had just moved to the canyon, and she was like, I'm from Maryland, and I used to, you know, she was like, I used to paddle rivers like the Yagagani and then this, and I kept on like paddle, whitewater, like, I, you know, we need to meet sometime. So we had a moment where we were like, you know, let's kind of check this out. We went to Flatwater first, and we were like, okay, you know how to get in a boat. You know how to do this stuff. And then we spent lots and lots and lots of time at Clear Creek, and we will spend hours. This is the first drop. Abby and I will spend hours. Very surf, very surf. Let's catch it. Uh, move. Back in 2012, we had the chance to run the Maine Salmon, and for us, it was a really amazing opportunity to kind of like do river trip. It was Abby's first multi-day trip. And then for us, it was a chance to do some big water where the Maine has these great big rapids, big pools down below. And I pulled this picture out, and I think for me, one of the things I remember is this was the moment where I felt like I had some clarity in my boating. And I can remember this is Black Creek Rapid, and you kind of can eddy out over here, pull out, and then run around here. And I can remember taking this left-hand turn and coming down this tongue and just remembering, like, I see the line, I see the moves, I'm going to make this, this is exactly what I'm going to do. And that was such a different moment for me because my back east paddling, while I had paddled maybe some challenging stuff, it was all frantic. It was all that sense of, like, <gasps> I don't know how I'm doing all this. But here was a moment where I just kind of marked a change in my, my um, willingness, but also a change in my identity and who I was starting to see myself as a boater. So the next year we had a chance to go to the Middle Fork, and I think we have two pictures because uh, there was a boat incident the first day and the camera was lost and we <laughs> don't have any pictures, but Middle Fork uh, steps up the pace from the main salmon and uh, Abby and I were able to paddle a good bit on this particular river. Well then, sometimes things that you don't even know about start to come your way, and for me, um, the Grand Canyon had never been like on my bucket list again. It hadn't been on my vision board. It wasn't a goal I needed to check. But we were playing the lottery, and Tyson's dad, Frank, he won the lottery with one little measly chance in the lottery. He pulled the permit for us to do the Grand Canyon. And so we, it had been about 10 years since that first awful, horrible trip, and we are like, okay, how can we, you know, make this better? And so thing number one, we were like, good people. <laughs> taking the right people with us. And so this was the crew that had been on the Middle Fork. Um, a couple of folks got to come on here just as a, a dream run for them. But we had the right group of people. And then we had the right group of people in the small boat. So this is Abby, Simone, and we call ourselves the Three Amigas sometimes. And um, one of the things we didn't know to do is we, we didn't have the wind. We kind of prayed, like, please don't let there be wind. But we didn't know to pray for no flash floods. So the second day of the river, the Pariah uh, Creek, flashed at 7,000 CFS, and it brought a whole stream of debris down. I think Abby was in her kayak for a whole five minutes, and we were like, nope, riding in the rafts, but it was just nasty, ugly stuff. Um, but we still got to see some beautiful spots of the Grand Canyon, Havasu, spending time with each other. And then this particular day, this is one of my favorite pictures, because here Abby and I had run the big ones. We had gone through Horn, we had gone through Granite, um, gone through Hermit, the sun's setting, and we're just like, yeah, this is it. But all the while, we knew this was downstream. So this is Lava Falls, and even if you haven't done the canyon, you probably know a little bit about lava, have heard about it. So it's considered a class, I'm just going to say, class 10 on the class 10 scale. Some people may have, you know, re-ranked it to class 9, but it's messy. What I found on the Grand Canyon is, like, pretty much everything up until the 7s, like, you can be in it, and you can be like, okay, here we are, 8s and 9s get a little bit choppier, chatterier, and then this is just a whole mess. It's a mess for rafts. It's a mess for kayaks. Um, the nice thing about this is we didn't do this until day 17. So everything you're doing up until that day, you're kind of calibrating yourself, like, what, you know, what can lava possibly be like? And every stroke is in preparation for lava. Um, but even ahead of time, I knew that this was coming, and so I tried to think about what can I do to get ready for the Grand Canyon and for lava. So weeks ahead, Abby and I were spending tons and tons of time in Clear Creek, but we were starting to um, do some mental preparation. And so I was looking at a blog by this gal named Emily Shanblatt, and she paddles with Anna Levesque and paddles with Girls at Play and Mind Battery Paddle. And she was talking about getting ready to run this rapid, which is Gorilla on the Green Narrows near North Carolina. And she said several things were important for her. One was having a mantra. 
So in her blog, she shows pictures of her knuckles, and she writes in the words, locked in, so that when she's paddling downstream, she kind of reminds herself, like, you're in the mode, you're, you know, you're ready for this. She said, you need to have the skills. And so maybe you don't paddle this every time to get ready for that. You kind of like, you know, can paddle that aggressively in some other situations. And then she said, you need to visualize, visualize, visualize. So part of that for her was about being able to kind of see herself in that position. Here I am at the notch. Here I am in the middle. Here I am at the start. Here I am finishing well. And then she said, visualize calm. And she would say when she would think about this, she would notice her heart rate would jump. And then she would remind herself that when you're in this situation, you can calm yourself down. So I took some of her advice to heart, and I worked with mantras. So I asked all of my friends to send me encouraging words, and I wrote them in the bottom of my boat. And so as I was going down the Grand Canyon, I was like, okay, you're locked in, and don't forget to breathe, and you're awake, you're awesome, live like it. And I love this one, err on the side of boldness, and to visualize yourself doing it. And these were just my little words I could have to remind me to, you know, you're going to be courageous here. Uh, we, again, paddled Clear Creek, and it's amazing. Clear Creek can get you ready for the Selway, the Grand Canyon, all sorts of stuff. Spent a lot of time working on the river. Um, and I would visualize, I would sit in the floor of my living room in my boat with my iPad out, and I would watch videos of people going down the Grand Canyon, like through the GoPro version, and I would notice that heart rate, and I'm like, whew, whew, calm. And I could feel that on the canyon, and we'd get into these rapids, and I would feel that sense of calm. But another thing that started to help was uh, with this TED Talk. And a quick side note, I love TED Talks. I love TED Talks. But Amy Cuddy, back in 2012, presented, presented this one about your body language. And she studies nonverbal gestures and how people communicate nonverbally. And she said, you know, a lot of the science and the research has been done about what happens between people. But she said, what about the nonverbals that we send ourselves? Could we do something maybe to kind of change the way we're talking to ourselves? And so her research team looked at this idea of power poses. And so she said power poses are those positions that people take when they feel confident, when they feel victorious. Sometimes those are poses like, yeah, one, or like kind of the, you know, the power poses you might see uh, Oprah have. But here she talks about Wonder Woman. And she said if you're standing in this position for two minutes, and that was the key to the research, you will have an increase in testosterone, a drop in the stress level of cortisol, and that you find yourself more likely to have confidence in riskier situations like job interviews. And I was like, like job interviews? I was like, and like the Grand Canyon. So I was practicing my power poses. We'd go scout a rapid, and here I am, power posing. And if we weren't scouting, I was in my boat, power posing. Uh, and you can see that. You can start to see my hand right here. This is right above lava, but this one, can you see it? Power posing. <laughs> I will run lava falls. So one of the things that we did when, we were, when I was visualizing, I was visualizing myself running through the rapids, but I think for me, what I realized is I need to visualize myself saying yes. And so there were so many rapids in my life that I'd walk to the, to the top to scout, and I'm like, no. Like, I'm just not that, you know, I was like, I'm not that person. I'm too scared. I'm too this and too that. And so when I started to visualize, I was like, you are going to walk to the top of the rapid, and you will scout it, and you will say yes, and you will run it until something bad happens. And so this particular day, it was so hot, and I can remember being at the top of this rapid, not feeling too scared, but feeling like, let's just do it. Let's go. Um, and so we started down this rapid. Some of the rafts went first, and we kind of run over here on the right side. There's a bubble line that you begin to follow, and you're following through here. You get into this mess called the V wave. Hopefully you get through it. You want to start to move to the left if you can so that you avoid the big kahuna and the cheese grater rock. We pull out, and Abby's in front, and I can remember so clearly following her, and we start to move into the water, and I see her blonde ponytail, I see a glint of light off her helmet, and then she disappears. <laughs> and then I felt like I disappeared. And I know I got worked uh, probably about the V wave, and I remember trying to roll, and trying to roll, and then I swam, and uh, got rescued somewhere probably down right about here. <laughs> <laughs> and then we made it to Tequila Beach, and we were all celebrating because none of the rafts had tipped, and Abby had flipped, but she rolled up, and I was still like, yay! I said yes! I said yes! And that was such a huge moment for me not to, um, to back down away from this. Um, but a couple of things I've learned about kind of growing into courage is that it's not me, like I couldn't have done it all alone, is that it takes people... Oh, oops, it takes time and it takes practice. And so it's played out in some other real places in my life. And this past year, I was like, okay, I'm going to try to do something courageous. So I love TED, and we have a great TED program here in the Denver area. 
and I was like, I've got some really amazing ideas about education and deep convictions. I want to change things. And so I put my name in the hat, and I got to audition. Well, I didn't get asked to the TED stage, but I'm like, I said yes, <laughs> and I got to give it a try. And on the way down to uh, this audition, I was power posing, and I was looking at my mantras, and uh, my Grand Canyon life had begun to inform my real life in this time. So since then, that's been about four years ago, we've had more chances to kind of grow into courage. And this past year, we spent time on the Yampa River, um, looking at the amazing scenery, especially this one. Isn't this a great picture? Can you see the kayaks down there looking at the tiger wall? You're supposed to kiss that wall so that you have a good run at Warm Springs. And then we had a chance to do the Selway, and the Selway was definitely the bucket list. So the Selway I knew was a Idaho Four Rivers lottery. And I knew Idaho was amazing, so the Selway had to be amazing, but I hadn't done much reading up on the Selway before we got the permit, because who thinks we're going to get a permit to the Selway? Nobody, because they only give one launch a day, so they only have 62 permits for the whole permit season. So you don't really think you're ever going to get to go. So as I started to do, read about this, or read about how beautiful it was, uh, about how the Selway, because Selway is one of the original wild and scenic rivers, and if you don't know much about the wild and scenic rivers, you should thank politicians for that because they protect these beautiful places for their recreational and their scenic value and uh, just a quick kudos to places like American Whitewater that work to make sure even more rivers are getting protected with wild and scenic status but I didn't know about the Selway and how technical it was so when I started to do research people were like it's kind of like the middle fork but on steroids I was like really I thought it was just gonna be like kind of like the middle fork well it's beautiful like the middle fork but um, on one particular day the river takes a left-hand turn, and this creek begins to feed into it, and this is Moose Creek. And then after that, you got a class four, and on down the map page, it's another four, and another four, and another four, sprinkled in with a three, and lots of threes to finish it off. The volume doubles with Moose Creek coming in. I was like, oh, I didn't know that was the Selway. And so uh, we were able to run it really, really well. And Abby and I were able to, to paddle this, and she's usually out in front. I'm usually following up in the back. But it was another opportunity to me, for me to think about, well, the Grand Canyon, that was, you're, it's not over. That's not the only time you were courageous, because now you get to have another chance. And so on the very last day, we have Wolf Creek, and it's a class four. And it's uh, got some pretty shallow, rocky, nasty stuff over here. And then a nice tongue, but then it feeds into all these huge diagonals, and then there's a big rock that everything's piling up to over here. Oh, we've had a successful run, but on this particular day, Abby was like, do you want to go first? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So luckily Tyson caught it on video, and you're going to be looking up on the screen. I'm going to come in first for a very interesting ride, but I'm going to be about this big, and then you'll see Abby come down. That's me. And there I go, backwards. <laughs> <laughs> That's Tyson's dad doing her commentary. Yeah. Woohoo. So once you've kind of grown into courage, you're not just there. For me, I find like I have to practice courage a lot, and it takes time. Uh, you know, my story of courage in my water career has been 20 year span, and it's e even goes. But now that I've had more time being courageous, I know a little bit more of what it's like to get there and more of what I need to do. And then I find it takes people. Um, definitely couldn't have done this without you know, my good friends and having someone in the water that I can kind of ride on her coattails in confidence and without my raft support and without people nearby encouraging me to be this way. And so um, I found this great quote in a book the other day. It says, the promise of stretching is not success. It's learning, it's self-insight. It's the promise of cleaning answers to the most important and vexing questions of our lives. What do we want? What can we do? Who can we be? And what can we endure? And that comes from Chip and Dan Heath. And I think for me, when I look at whitewater sports, sometimes we glorify the waterfalls and the class five and the people that were born boating. But I think we've missed out a little bit when we haven't given value to the stories that people have as they kind of grow into this beautiful sport, no matter what their level and no matter where they are. And so um, my river story actually starts to parallel just a little bit with my art story, but I actually kind of, I find it a little funny because I think I'm on the other side where I wasn't born into risk and adventure. I was born into art and creativity. Um, 
and it started with my sweet grandmother. She's 94 years old. She still makes a lot of quilts. Oh, she made some of these cathedral window quilts, one for each of her four kids. And then one year, with between July and December, she made 13 quilts, one for each of the grandchildren. My aunt, this is Anita, and she's been working on barn quilts. And these are these big designs that use quilt-like patterns. And people in the South begin to hang them on their barns and their buildings. And then uh, this is Ava. She's an interior designer. And not only does she do creative stuff in people's homes, she makes her own award-winning quilts. And so one of the things I've learned in my family is that it's been OK to spend your time and your money and your energy doing beautiful things with your hands and being able to take creative risks. But a lot of people I know, and if Carol were here, she would be like, I'm one of these people. They're like, no, I don't do creativity. No, 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 that's not me. Because a lot of times people are afraid it's going to turn out like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, I love, love this picture. This is my niece, Maddie. Drew, this is me and Tyson and Sawyer, our dog, Raffing. <laughs> but oh, it's kind of an interesting point. Elizabeth Gilbert talks about how um, we lose creativity in our life, and when we come back to it again, we'll come back to the developmental age we were when we stopped being creative. So if you stopped drawing and writing and doing creative things in fourth grade, fifth grade, when you start back again, you're probably going to look like a fourth or fifth grader who's doing that type of artwork. And so a lot of times we're scared because we're like, it's not going to be good. It's going to be ugly. And um, it's all a part of a process. So I've been doing just creative things a long time. My mom sent me this. This was from 2000. It was like, oh, yeah, I've changed a lot since then. But I happen to be watching a TED talk, and uh, this guy named Matt Cutts talks about how he tried new things for 30 days, and he gave up sugar, and he took pictures every day for 30 days, and I was like, oh, I want to do one of those experiments and try to learn something for 30 days. And I'm a teacher, and I was thinking, oh, this would be great for me to think about what it's like to be a beginner and how to learn. So I was like, I'm going to do watercolors. Oh, and I remember when. It was 2013 when the floods were happening. We live in Coal Creek. Our poor canyon was getting pummeled. Uh, Rose were getting destroyed. Our liquor store was dying. And um, <laughs> Tyson was out saving the canyon in the world. And I'm like, no, 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 not me. I'm just going to be staying inside, and I'm going to do some art. And this was part of my 30-day project. I started to look at books and look at instructions and paint from pictures. To, and then after the, the floods, when I could get to town, I took a class with this amazing artist in Golden named Janet Nunn. And at the end of 30 days, I was like, huh. You know, I don't think I'm going to stop. This was a pretty good go, and I really think there's something special here with what's happening with um, my adventure into art. So since then, I've taken several different challenges. Sometimes I'll do like a drawing a day type of challenge. Um, and every one of my friends and several of my friends here, every one of them have my artwork because once you start to make it, you just can't keep it all. You just need to give it away. And one of my friends said, happy birthday, enjoy your day. Can you finish my car to you and paint the other side? You know, so when you start doing art, people are just like, just keep on doing it. Um, but I've started to call myself a river artist and not just an artist. And part of it is because of the subject matter, because I love rivers and I love boats. And I did a couple of projects, this little book of boats of all the boats I've loved before. Um, and I'll start to do uh, some of the content with rafts. But I don't only just paint river stuff. Sometimes I paint cities if I'm hanging out in a city uh, or I'll paint with do some books. But I think I call myself a river artist, not just because of the subject matter. Part of it is because where I paint, I'll take my paint kit to the rivers. Um, and a lot of times when people are playing cornhole or they're out fishing or out hiking, I'm sitting on the side of the river and I'm just painting because that's something that brings me joy. And I think a river artist because I want to be, I want my art to remind me of what the river does. That the river brings me together with people, and the river challenges me, and it's beautiful, and it's been this thing that's been threading my life together, and that's what I want my art to do. And so um, I'll take people's photographs. This is on the Middle Fork. This is Pistol Creek. And sometimes I'll just kind of paint my own little postcard and tell my stories through art. And this is one of my favorite things to do is to share art with people on the river. These are my nieces and my friend Amy, who's also an artist and a river artist too. But um, taking my paints so other people can enjoy this process on the river. So what I want us to think about tonight <coughs> is that um, we can grow into courage in lots of ways, and we want to value the process. And so we're going to do a little bit of painting tonight so that you can have that moment, maybe to create something beautiful, maybe something ugly. But you can say yes, OK, and to kind of give that spirit a try of what's it like to try something new? What's it like to kind of do something maybe a little bit different 